Well, 46 kilometers to go to the finish. Of that, 17 kilometers are up the Col de Tourmalé. 13 kilometers are up to the finish at Lutz Ardidem. 30 kilometers of those 46 kilometers are up, and most of the other lots are down. And so it's a bit like the Duke of York and his umpteen thousand men. You see they're up or down. March them up the mountainside and march them down again. Well, when they get to the top, it'll be, they'll be breathing a sigh of relief. This is the last day in the big mountains. Uh, but Sean, from now on in, although we have rest day tomorrow, there's one or two uh, um, stages where people can be caught out. Is this, I mean, sort of fancy. I've often thought when you get to the Alps or the, um, or the Pyrenees, there's well, the run, run back to Paris, there's not much going for it. But some of the teams that haven't had a stage victory Victory can go, and if, if do you think if the gap is still like it is now, coming into stage today with Armstrong just uh, what, five minutes and 13 seconds away from uh, Ulrich, and, uh, from uh, Ulrich, and bearing in mind we've got a 60 odd kilometre uh, time trial later on, that if Ulrich can close the gap down a bit today, that raiding parties uh, will give us a very interesting run towards the finish in Paris. What do you think? Well, I think, uh, yes, we could see, uh, and we have seen it before, we, see, we could see uh, as things happen after the mountains, people attacking and Ulrich, uh, he might try and do something on the easier stages, but there is a few stages which are up and down, and the stage to pole is a hard stage, it's up and down all day, there's no flat, uh, but it's it's difficult to, uh, uh, you know, the race leader, um, and especially the US Post, as we see him yesterday, I think they're, they're, getting, they're getting it together better. Uh, they had problems at the beginning, of course, they had a lot of crash they had a uh, sore knee, Harris had a sore knee and uh, uh, the teammate uh, Ribeiro, he also had a sore knee and we see, you know, there was uh, caught up in a few clashes so uh, I think uh, it would be difficult to do anything on the flatter stages but, uh, and also you must remember the guys who were there, uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth in general, they are trying to uh, defend their places well after the mountain so there's a lot of teams to ride because they all want to defend their places uh, right, on to, right on to Paris when you come out of the, uh, of the mountains, out of the Pyrenees so I don't, I don't see anything that can be done after that. Naturally, there is maybe some place, uh, the fourth, fifth place could change a bit if there's only a number of seconds because depending on the time trial, how good the guys are, one guy could frog leap uh, the other guy because if he's a better time trial. All that lies ahead, uh, our coverage on Eurosport going right the way through till the final Sunday. If some of you are not going to listen to our programmes during the week, or I hope you'll pick up uh, at least the highlights programme in the evening, then we look forward to welcoming you to uh, Paris. I hope that uh, you will come and be there just to soak up the atmosphere. Even though we've lost uh, David Miller from the race following that crash, he sold it on for about 10 days before finally his injuries and uh, took t uh, complete toll of his morale and he went back. Uh, we'll be inviting on Eurosport and Sky. We'll be inviting a couple of winners for a competition to come and join us a week from now on the Champs Elysees, um, and it's well worth making plans to go and see if you can get some really cheap tickets to go there to, to, to take a gang of you. Even if you have got any British interest, the atmosphere on the Champs Elysees is really tremendous with the people there, and uh, whoever wins, the spe spectators from their country and their supporters will come in massive numbers. And the same thing, those uh, families and friends and people that have been following the race round will be there too. And the atmosphere is really fantastic. Uh, and this year there is a, a cafe called um, the, the Eurosport Cafe, which is about to be walked down from the Arc de Triomphe, about uh, 400 yards down the Rue de Berry, turn left down there, and that is where uh, there is the Eurosport Cafe with umpteen um, uh, TV sets round the walls, and I think we're going to get a mass of people in there too as well. It's breaking up at the back as it's breaking up at the front. It's better thought then for these riders who've still got to go over the Tourmalet and down the other side. That is Jonathan Volters. We haven't seen Shula Grady recently, but he was tail off quite uh, some time ago. Amazing now to see one of the lads from the Rascadel team. That's Cast Castasana, just drifting up to there, 166 at uh, uh, Peladu. Interesting uh, in the lead group, David. Uh, we had the, we had the ten riders, but uh, there's uh, there's four riders who went uh, out of that group, and we have the you know the six in front of of Belly, Mario Apps, Mon Moncotti, 
Julik and Gobert and Montgomery. But the interesting thing is, uh, Cloden has uh, uh, has been dropped out of that group. I don't reckon he's been dropped. Uh, you know, Hepner possibly could get dropped out, but Cloden, he's a very good climber. He was very strong in the earlier part, so I'm surprised at this. Uh, it could be some sort of tactic that they're working in the uh, in the telecom team. And isn't that Vunicroft just drifting off the front there too as well? They're chaining left, right, and centre. There's certainly pink. It looks like Vunicroft coming up here at the moment. It certainly looks like a, a, a tactical ploy. Axel Merckx and Vinyokrov. Yes, and two other riders come up to them as well. 11 kilometers to go to the top. And is, another, is there another picture of it coming up or one of the Anse riders? They certainly stretched this one. Um, they fired Vinokrov off before the telecom team. They had two men down the road earlier on with uh, with Hepner out there and Cloden as well. So uh, Odrizal is still wedged out in no man's land. I suppose wondering what's hitting him. He hasn't been able to get up there, nor has he had any company for any long th length of time because Bladson couldn't hold his wheel. So um, really, the pressure is on right now, and it's Axel Merckx is doing. He's the best placed rider uh, from his team, by the way, at the moment. Axel Merckx uh, is up there for the uh, Domo Farm Freaks, best uh, rider uh, for them on the general classification at the moment and he's now hammering up here and let's look down on the general classification and just to put you in the picture this morning Lance Armstrong in the yellow jersey was just ahead of uh, Kivilev by 3 minutes and 54 seconds he rides for yes postal Armstrong Kivilev rides for the Confidence team he's the best place rider for Confidence at 3.54 in second spot overall then the third place rider is Francois Simon uh, for Bonjour French rider at 4 minutes and 31 seconds. He's the best place rider for Bonjour. Uh, then in fourth spot, uh, Jan Ulrich, best place rider for Telecom at 5 minutes and 13 seconds. Uh, Bilocki in fifth spot at the moment for Anse team there at 6 minutes and 2 seconds. Uh, Gonzalez Galdiano uh, also from Anse at 10 minutes 42 is in sixth. Sevilla for Kelme is seventh at 13.24. Botero eighth at 15 and ninth Serrano and tenth Gartelli. Forty-three kilometres to go then, and uh, interesting the way in which the telecom are playing out the race today. Well, David and Sean, here's the uh, statistic on the Col du Tourmalet, which has been uh, part of the Tour de France now for so long. First used in 1910, the very first time, as you mentioned earlier in your commentary, David, that the race ever came into the, uh, the Pyrenees. And that was when uh, Octave Lapiz was first over the top on his way to victory in that 1910 Tour de France. More recently, though, Alberto Elli has been the king of the Tourmalet a couple of times. Uh, and so to Richard Veron, sandwiched in between the Spaniard, Pascal Rodriguez, in 1997. And I just wonder how well Laurent Jalabert will do on this one. Will he get any points? And here's a little statistic for you to mull over, David and Sean. If... Laurent Jalabert succeeds in taking that um, polka dot jersey to Paris next week, a week, or a week tomorrow. He will uh, join a very exclusive club which currently only has one member, Eddie Merckx. He will be the second rider only since we instigated the points jersey in 1953 to be the holder of a green jersey at any time in his career and a polka dot jersey. Only Eddie Merckx has ever won a green jersey to take home and a polka dot jersey. Jalabert could be number two. Thanks for that then, Mike, full of statistics as ever. And yeah, I thought if, if you go back to Eddie Merckx's career, he's the only one that's done everything. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he hasn't done. Oh, he didn't win the Pursuit Champion of the World, did he? Which is, uh, most of the, the chaps who won the Tour de France at some time had a go at that. Uh, he didn't get the hour record, by the way, so that's another thing to uh, have a go at. But uh, Moment Armstrong hasn't uh, has decided to go and go on the track and try the hour record. There was some talk about uh, Alano going for Chris Boardman's athlete's record, but I think he's stopped that one now. But uh, this is the way in which it's all splitting up on the screen. Sure, more uh, view, uh, view from the front, because it does seem that uh, the, uh, the team car's going forward, that ten-man group at the front, uh, I think it's splitting at the moment. Yes, well, it's, it's, it, is, it is breaking up. Uh, you know, there's, four, there's four riders got dropped from that uh, ten-man group, Hepner, Claude, and Podzi, and Robin. Uh, and uh, 
the surprising one, as I said, was that to see Clothing get dropped. And uh, but we see, and uh, there was another attack uh, of a group from the from the peloton, from the bunch of six riders, and there was Bolts and Vinyukov who was in that Sastre, Butcherov, Cardenas, and Merx. We see, uh, but the, the telecoms, you know, they uh, and Bolts we see going on his own. He was leaving them six riders, so uh, the telecoms are very very active. And uh, the Bidesto, Ibanesto here on the front, uh, there's loads of Spanish spectators out, loads of Basque spectators out today. It uh, certainly is a great day for the uh, specialist mountain climbers and uh, 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 the uh, specialist climbers uh, trying to do something today, but uh, in reality the battles between Armstrong and Ulrich, who are not really specialist climbers. Best and Italian riders final ranking. Um, that's to take me a little bit by surprise, David, but we'll keep nonetheless. <laughs> yes, well, of course, the Italians have traditionally done well in the Tour de France, haven't they? As indeed many French riders from time to time have done well in the Giro d'Italia. But Marco Pantani, in recent times, really has done exceptionally well, hasn't he? That win in 1998, two other rostrum places, podium places in 94 and 97. Ivan Gotti, a former winner of the Giro d'Italia, of course, had a fifth placing in the Tour de France back in 95. Claudio Chiapucci, the cheeky one, sixth in 93. And Daniel Nardello, of course, has had his problems in this tour, had an early crash, and he was very lucky to survive it. Still going, and of course he's wearing the current Italian Championship jersey. Nardello was in the top ten both last year and the year before. And Alberto Elli, twice first over the top of the Tourmalet, well, he managed a 15th place in 1995. Italians regularly featuring well in the Tour de France. Well, the Tourmalet over the years, uh, we're going across the, uh, the Tourmalet and uh, since it was there in 1910, first climb, it's, uh, had, it's been over some 68 years we've used the Tourmalet in the Tour de France. Of the 88 uh, editions of the Tour de France, 68 uh, of those editions have gone over. So only 20 times have we missed the Tourmalet. Uh, in fact, we've done more than that. We've actually gone over 72 times because we've gone over one side and come back again just to make life a bit difficult. So it's 72 from 88, which makes some 16 times when we haven't gone over it in the 68 years uh, that's been racing. The Tourmalet was first climbed in 1910, and in fact, uh, Henri de Grand sent his assistant out to the uh, Pyrenees to see if it was possible for them to go over the, the Pyrenees. They thought about time to uh, make the race a bit tougher since it was formed in 1903. And uh, four kilometres from the Col de Tourmalet, Blizzard stopped uh, uh, the de Grand's assistant, and he had to abandon his car. And uh, he, he then st went down uh, 12 kilometres down the snowbound slopes uh, in the night. Uh, and there he sent next morning to uh, de Grange in Paris and he sent this uh, famous telegraph he said I've crossed the Tourmalet on foot by night the road is passable for vehicles no snow lying through his teeth but he feel, felt that eventually when the road uh, would be open from snow and the time the Tour de France would come around as he did in 1910 they should include it into the uh, into the schedule that's exactly what they've done they put it in now since 1910 and Lapise Octave Lapise was the first over there and uh, he was a great all-round cyclist. He won the bronze medal in the Olympic Games in 1908 in the 100km race. Amateur champion of France, champion of France, cyclocross rider, winner of the Tour de France in 1910 when he won four stages of Olympic. Go on and on, he won the Paris-Brussels Paris and also second in the Paris-Brest-Paris. That's a phenomenal uh, event and he was second in that. So uh, hats off for chapeau to Octave Lapis, who was the first man over the Tourmalet. And uh, that was the idea then of Henri de Grange's assistant and we're going also to have a very special uh, prize when we get over the top of this uh, in memory uh, of uh, the great man uh, Jacques Godard who was the, the, really the driving force behind the Tour de France in recent years so Jack Godard's memorial will be up there the big bust on top of the climb and a special prize too for the first man over the top how's the third race going now Sean I've been digging back in the books how do you see it? Well, it's, uh, it's still very active out there. Uh, the leading group is uh, those riders uh, uh, falling off that pace, and uh, we have, you know, five riders who have lost contact with it now. Hepner, or uh, Goubert, was the last one to uh, uh, to lose. He's, he's just... Uh, 100, 150 metres off the uh, off the rear of the group. We still have up in the front. We have Belly, we have Mario Ass, we have Moncotti, we have Julik, and uh, as I said, Goubert has lost contact. Robin also has got dropped, and Montgomery is still up there. So, uh, but interesting thing, we have uh, a group coming up from behind, and they're about uh, uh, they've, they've taken about 30 or 40 seconds out of the group, which is uh, Boas, Vinyukrov, Sastre, Monse, uh, Butcherov, Caldenas, and Merckx. So a lot of action here, and uh, uh, 
Um, a lot of Ryan's being dropped from the bunch also. There's a lot of, a lot of guys in trouble we see and they're just uh, losing contact uh, all the time. Here's Sets another Mike, Yes, Harris. David, here's another one. Uh, this is very interesting, of course, because this really is the whole nub of the race where Armstrong has gained his time on his nearest rival, Jan Ulrich. It was only three seconds in the prologue. That was very, very tight. The team time trial, well, that worked in their favour, just 24 seconds. But then those four mountain stages, and look at that. Two minutes on Alpe d'Huez, one minute in the time trial at Duchamp-Rouge, 31 seconds at axe les and only yesterday, just over one more minute up to Plat d'Adey. Those were all mountain top finishes, including that mountain time trial. This also is a mountain top finish when we get to Luzardi, then it does beg the obvious question. Is Armstrong going to take even more time out of Ulrich and make it a nap hand of five mountain top finishes, or can Ulrich somehow find some inner strength and pull a little bit back? Well, it's looking very interesting here, Sean, because there we saw statistics about where Armstrong was doing the damage at the back end of the race. Uh, do you think they're going to wait that last climb at the moment, or, or is, is, is Ulrich going to use these stepping stones? Well, uh, we see there's still uh, uh, there's still six or seven kilometres to the top of uh, of the Tromelay, so I think uh, you know it's it's there's still a long ways to go, and we can see a lot uh, a lot of action. I think we definitely will see something from Ulrich here to try and uh, you know to break down the peloton and make it smaller and get rid of a lot of the riders and hopefully some of uh, Armstrong's teammates. Well, that's there. 41 kids go with his little group of riders here. That's uh, Udo Bolts too, looking very active at the moment. Surprising on a climb like this that uh, he's up there again. Does that say there's some tactical movements going on here? Because you wouldn't see him normally up there, would you? Well, I think uh, Merckx. No, it's Bolts. Bolts, sorry. Uh, well, yes, I, I'm surprised that you know the telecom guys are, uh, are, are, are coming out of the bunch uh, in such numbers. Uh, you know, any any sort of attack, they seem to be a telecom at least one, and you know now we've uh, uh, we've seen two there just uh, just at the moment. Um, I think they are preparing something because normally they, should, they, they would be more in, more more of them staying with uh, with Ulrich. Uh, so I think he, you know, in the uh, in the in the so, towards the top of the climb in the last four or five kilometres, which is you know very very hard when you get to Munguni, Mon, uh, it's a, it's a very very steep part there. So I think we could see uh, uh, we could see Ulrich uh, trying uh, like we see yesterday, uh, uh, you know, going into the attack as he has uh, a, a number of teammates up the road. And being controlled now by the US Postal team. We've seen that before too, so they don't show any cracks at the moment, do they? Eh? Well, I think the US Postals have got to uh, uh, to keep setting a, uh, a pace because if they uh, if they don't do that, well, then there's going to more and more riders attack, and eventually, then you have you know you have uh, too many riders up the road, and it's difficult to control when you get uh, when you get you know uh, ten. Uh, 10 plus rails off the road as it is we have quite a number getting across and you know if you leave if you leave too many well then it's it's, it's a disaster because it's so difficult to chase down a, a big group of 15 or 20 riders well they are then and uh, climbing rather steadily we, we seem to have uh, uh, had a, a what am i call a more steady climb this time sean in most of the climbs so far i've been surprised in this race that we've been even at this early stage of the bigger climbs have been seeing more aggression and, and a, a group sort of splitting but this strikes me as one of the most modest pace we've had in the uh, the pyrenees so far well, yes, this is a you know a pretty steady pace since the uh, uh, since they came through the feed zone, and you know the gap was around uh, around the four minutes, and you know they haven't uh, they haven't pulled back that uh, very much. So um, it proves that it's a quite uh, it's quite a steady pace. But you know if you uh, if you look to the back of the bunch, there's still riders going out all the time, and we see you know riders just being shelled off in ones and twos all the time. So, uh, but uh, you know if, if if there's an extra if there's an attack from the likes of Ulrich or some some of the you know the main as well then we would see the group blowing to pieces you know very very rapidly well Gartelli who tried yesterday to win the stage finished in fifth spot at 2 minutes 29 seconds he's out uh, on his own now he's breaking away from the, the pack looking to try and get up to uh, uh, these early breakaways this 10 man group but it started quite some way down uh, even before we got to, to this particular climb and they're now soldering on up here and uh, it looks as if Gartelli is going to try and come up to, to join up with them and we've now got 5 kilometres to go towards the top there Manchevo is fantastic Club, uh, Sean met up with his mother yesterday. She said he was going to win the stage. In fact, he finished 13th, and lucky for some, uh, six minutes, three seconds down. He won the uh, best young riders jersey last year, best place young rider, uh, 
Francesco Amancebo, and he finished yesterday 13th. The man who finished 12th was Oscar Sevilla, who is wearing the white jersey as uh, best uh, young rider, and he just came in just ahead of him. So those two riders very closely matched, and then more Manchebo stickers and banners out on the side of the road. And yet again, uh, Vunacrom, I think, is starting to come up to them here, and uh, we know how many pink jerseys are all over the uh, course at the moment. This is a rather interesting way because they've just gone up with uh, Menchov, uh, the Russian rider. He's been going up with uh, Vunacrom, the Kazakhstan rider. They're just now going to pick up another of the uh, Deutsche Telekom, Udo Boltz, up there. Well, it's a fascinating setup now. We've had four kimmies to go to go underneath one of these uh, snow covers. And more statistics uh, from Mike in Paris. Yes, thanks, David. And here's just a confirmation of the latest situation in the King of the Mountains ranking. Laurent Jalabert still with that very, very comfortable margin over Laurent Roux, who, of course, himself held the polka dot jersey for many, many days. Ulrich and Armstrong obviously featuring very highly in the King of the Mountains ranking because they're the men who featured at the end of the affairs on the previous four mountain top finishes. Armstrong, let's remind ourselves, winning three of those four stages. Unbelievable. And he was third on the other one, wasn't he? So obviously, they've been uh, massing the points but Lolo Jalabert as I say he could be heading uh, for that rather membership of that extremely unique club if you've just tuned in a reminder he has won two green jerseys in the past he could well win a polka dot jersey and only Eddie Merckx has ever done that before him well thank you Mike Zabelda coming off uh, from the Rescatello Escudi team a great uh, sea of orange uh, t-shirts on the top of this climb and also uh, way down in the valley of the Kamak the other side more orange t-shirts as we go up then uh, towards the top the finish of today the uh, interesting uh, piece we saw on our uh, pictures then. I don't know if you saw it, it was in the top left hand corner. It looked like Tyler Hamilton had gone back to Team Car, he grabbed a bottle. Uh, I'm not quite sure he went to feed somebody or whether they were saying, well, bye bye Tyler. He didn't seem to be uh, going back for anybody else's uh, assistance, uh, Sean, to bring any bottles up there. Do you think he's now out the back until we go for the final climb? Yes, I think it was bye bye from. Uh you know, he seemed to have lost uh, too much ground uh, on the uh, on the main group. Uh, if it was just coming back for the drinks uh, for all the riders, uh, I think he's done his uh, he's done his job. Uh, we see him setting the pace for uh, quite a while, and I think yeah, uh, he's uh, you know he's on the way out the real door, as they say. But a lot of action up there on the front. You know, there's riders coming up uh, from the bunch, and there's riders getting dropped from the break. We see we see Gobert and we see uh, Pudzi. Uh, you know, those guys going back, and uh, we see other guys like a Bowles and. Uh, a Junior Croft Sastry coming up, so there's a lot of confusion there. It's hard to, uh, uh, for the Royals themselves, it's hard to, you know, uh, uh, keep uh, keep control. You know who's uh, who's going up the road because it's, it's it's chopping and changing so much with Royals going off the front and Royals coming back from the from the leading breakaway. But uh, now take, uh, driving at the front, then we've got a couple of pictures that come through now. I think the Gris up there at the moment. Uh, bear in mind, some of their drives gone up the front uh, and uh, providing that stepping stone. Uh, and I don't see the US Postals quite in the same number. So is this where we might see a bit of fire, Sean? Because with, with uh, the Deutsche Telekom, with two rides up the, up the front there, or is it three now? Well, uh, yes, I'm. Well, yes, there's uh, Claude and is, uh, Claude and is in there. I think Hepner has been. Uh, I'm not sure if he's been taken in by the bunch, but we have Bowles and Vinyakov certainly up there, so we have three up there. Telecom. Well, it's indeed being matched at the moment at the front of that uh, pack with um, just like Garini up there, and it might be Claude as well. I didn't quite pick out the other rider with. Uh, Ulrich, but just behind there were a couple of the US Postals with Lance Armstrong, so they're fairly fair well evenly matched in the in the chase group, uh, trying to come up to what's left of our breakaway pack. Still Bobby Julik uh, riding along here quite comfortably. We're going, going to try and talk to uh, his uh, team manager, Roger Leger, at some point, because uh, Bobby Julik has had good days and bad days. He was one chap we were looking to probably be in the top ten place overall, but he had a couple of bad days, but uh, when he's come back from those bad days, he's been quite capable of uh, riding with the best of them on the climbs. So there we are, back again to the back of the, of the, uh, of the race today, and they are really being struggling a bit here. That's uh, Benito from the Bonjour team, accelerating a little bit. Spare a thought, by the way, as you're seeing these specialist climbers who are having a certain amount of difficulty. Actually, Pereira just uh, spotted then. 
and he is the Venezuelan Eche Pereira, not the Spanish Eche Pereira. Uh, we've just gone past uh, Guterres, no, it wasn't, it was uh, Pascal Laurent uh, just been dropped off. And uh, well, Ekimov, his job is mainly on the flatter parts of the course, and he's now he's going to have to ride uh, within himself and try and get, make a bit of time up on the descent. It's every man for himself. Uh, this Tourmalet is taking no prisoners today, but uh, I think the field would probably be happy to go at this sort of rate, um, Sean. It doesn't seem to be what well, I've seen a lot faster climbs up uh, in the past, and uh, not being disrespectful to them, but some, something tells me that uh, it's a wearing down process and all will go out the window on the final climb. How do you, how do you see it? Well, it's certainly a wearing down climb, and you know, when you have, a, uh, when you have the distance uh, of uh, 16, uh, almost 17 k's of a climb, and there's still, uh, for the bunch, there's still 5 or 6 k's at the top, and uh, the top is quite steep, there's quite, uh, quite steep uh, uh, sections in it, and you know, if, if there's an attack, well then we, we would see that leading group of Armstrong and Ulrich would explode to pieces and there'd be riders everywhere, and as a TG you can see a lot of good riders going out uh, of the group, out the rear, uh, the rear door, so... It's, it's certainly a wearing, a wearing down process, and you know even in the breakaway group here we see, you know they've come down to five men with you know Belly, Arts, Munkuti, uh, um, uh, Montgomery is still there. So you know it's it's definitely a wearing down process, and of course the day is the day as well is so warm it will be you know very very uh, a very very tiring on the bodies, and I think uh, on the final climb I think we will see a lot of riders. And if you uh, you know if you uh, if you go into the red too much and you you kind of explode here, well then you lose the minutes just be, just go by so quickly. You're watching on Eurosport stage 14 of the Tour de France going from Tarbes where the race start this morning to Lutz Ardiden. A bit of a circular course taking the riders over uh, today to begin with uh, two fourth category and one third category climb followed by first category climb of the Col d'Aspin and two up category climbs the Col de Tourmalet and the Lutz Ardiden. And so as they're now uh, climbing this one the Col de Tourmalet when they get to the top there will just be uh, some 38 kilometres to go. Uh, on the run this morning they start out to cover 144 kilometres that's 90 miles and and uh, the great climbs that lie ahead of them first climbed in 1910. Everybody could see in the distance the Pyrenees looming. And my goodness, they were clear to see because the sun has come out baking hot off the stones and the rocks and uh, off the tarmac here. And the devil himself, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, he turns out looking just like that uh, to encourage the uh, riders. They all know him. He keeps out of the way, thank goodness. There are some spectators often get in the way. But here he is and uh, on the... The thin air, by the way, I think right now he'd be breathing very deep. Not only is the air thin, it's very hot too. The temperature this morning, 30 degrees in Tarp and 19 degrees at the top. But it's got a lot warmer than that was forecast. And in fact, uh, out of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the slightly drifting wind, it has been now touching 40 degrees, 40 degrees. And up at the finish, the same thing. If you're sheltered from the slight drifting wind, which is blowing up the finishing climb now, you're talking about... 20 degrees. Well, a sharp contrast to, to the Tour de France as it has been in the last two weeks with somewhat cold, wet and miserable weather. We started out with glorious sunshine in uh, the uh, days leading up to the start in Dunkirk and uh, that uh, prologue time trial, it got damp, it got miserable. Britain's David Miller skidded, crashed, burst his back tyre and hurt himself and that put him out of contention uh, for the yellow jersey. We went on then up into, uh, into uh, Belgium and across through Belgium and then further on down as a man gives us the moon there's some strange people about here that's where the trident ought to go anyway as we work through some of the weather in the last of two weeks we certainly sean have not seen weather like it's been cold and miserable hasn't it uh, and now we've got the sunshine this is typical tour de france weather eh? yes well this uh, this sort of condition is the typical tour weather uh, we started out with very, very bad weather and uh, a lot of rain, but not only the rain, the temperatures were very, very uh, low and it was very cold and uh, we see you know, a number of riders uh, sick and there is, uh, there is quite a few riders who are sick and of course, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there were some, there were some, there were some of the riders dropped out even because of the sickness, so uh, it's, it's definitely taken its toll, the bad weather. I think we've now got Roger Jay on the telephone, way down the climb of the Tourmalet. Uh, hello there, Roger. Uh, we'd just like to know, as you've got Bobby Julik up in front, what's been the the problem with Bobby, he's been having good days and bad days, uh, Roger. He looks on a good day today. What was the problems when he Hello. had a couple of bad days? Hello, can you hear me? I think we're having trouble. We have to close this down. Roger, can you hear me? Bother. 
excuse me, dear. dear. <laughs> we were going to get words from himself from Rod. You have to try that one later on, Paris. Um, the old uh, phones don't work that well in the mountains. Sorry about that, and uh, sorry we couldn't bring you Roger in the day, the uh, director sportif of the Great Agricole, but nice to hear his comments about uh, not only Bobby Julik here, but also uh, back to Stuart uh, O'Grady, who's further down the mountain, uh, working hard to stay inside the uh, time limit. This morning we did have a sprint, the first piece of action after 17 uh, kilometres at Banners de Bigori. He uh, sent his team made Voigt down the road to get maximum points. Petaki got the second spot and that's on third. No points for Zabel or uh, to O'Grady on that occasion. Call the Tumuli, if you could read it, we can all read it, we can see it. And, uh, well, it's a long grind up to here, but uh, further on when we get to the finish, if our cameras show you the shot of the finish at Lutzade Dam, which lies uh, just uh, some uh, 38 kilometres, or perhaps maybe about 40 kilometres now, they've got a bit to go to the top. Uh, I've never seen a shot like it uh, as when we came up uh, towards the finish today. How many of these riders will survive, I don't know, because the pressure's on from behind. And here we go, just taking the atmosphere of this, the climb up the famous uh, top of the climb here, the Tumulet, where there's going to be the souvenir to the man who was really one of the driving forces over many, many years. Uh, souvenir Jacques Godet, there's £2,000 for first, ten, and, and £1,000 for second total of £3,000 for just the two rides, first and second at the top. This is a race within a race. One or two rides drifting off here. You can just see, unfortunately, Bolts is going backwards. Can't hold the pace. Looks like it might be Vunacroft going backwards as well. It is. And also going backwards then from the US Postal is Odobira. Gorini, who's had a pretty, well... I suppose a, a, a no tour so far. We haven't seen much of him. He's the man who won the uh, tour of, of, of the Alpes climb, which we went up a couple of years ago, and he, on his way up, knocked over that spectator with the with the camera. He's been lying quiet so far. Looks like he's come back into form just the right time. He's driving up here then, and uh, he's taking up uh, Ulrich in fine form. But look at the yellow jersey, Lance Armstrong, just bobbing around on his pedals, sitting right behind Ulrich, waiting for some acceleration. And Ulrich looking back to see where he is. He's still there, Jan. He's still there. Well, there was some years ago, a particular rider who shall be name, nameless, who used to ride the Tour de France like you saw Lance Armstrong and Ulrich Ulrich and Lance Armstrong, we take it in turns to attack each other, but this particular rider uh, was always there uh, behind Eddie Merckx, and the, the joke was then that when they got to Paris, who was the rider without Eddie Suntan? And they named this particular rider because he's always in Eddie Merckx's shadow, but we haven't seen that with Ulrich and Armstrong. They've been having goes to battle each other uh, over the tops of the mountains, and they was, I think, uh, maybe still having a go towards the top of this climb. Uh, Sean, it seems to me, and you're the expert, I'm, I'm just a commentator here, sitting in the hot seat. It seems to me that um, uh, Armstrong and uh, Ulrich aren't at the moment going to rip the legs off each other up here. Maybe just the last kilometre or so. Uh, is, is that your view? Because it, it, they're just riding t tempo at the moment. Uh, is it just a wearing down process? Well, yes, the telecoms are riding tempo and, uh, you know, they're settling. Uh, I don't think they can ever uh, drop Armstrong or wish uh, setting a tempo like that. But, um, you know, there's so many tactics they can work, uh, uh, you know, later on in the climb. And, uh, you know, they, they want to make the group as small as possible, the main group, eliminate the riders by the rear door. And uh, you have less riders chase then if the tactic is that Ulrich is going to attack like we see yesterday. Uh, so, you know, uh, we just, it's, it's just... It's really a guess reason of what's going to happen, but I think Ulrich will try something on the on the uh, on the last couple of kilometres of this climb. Well, they're spread all over the place. It's a long, old, steady grind. This one, 17 kilometres, uh, 16 is. It's just over 10 miles. It's about 11 miles in English money. And you can see now a little bit of acceleration coming behind. That's got Sella on the left-hand side, who came good yesterday. Uh, with uh, He got sixth place yesterday, two minutes, 50, uh, 52 seconds down. Lifting the hopes of the MAP-18 that have not had the best uh, Tour de France so far. And uh, the overall situation, they get toward the top. The quick run down then on those top for 10 riders. In case you just switched on, on general classification this morning, Lance Armstrong, we've seen him in the yellow jersey. Leading overall, second place Kibilev at uh, 3 minutes 54. Third, Simon at 4 minutes 31. Fourth, Ulrich, 5 minutes 13. Fifth, Bilocki 
at 6 minutes and 2 seconds. Sixth, Gonzalez Galdiano at 10 minutes and 42 seconds. Seventh, Sevilla, best young rider at 13 minutes and 24 seconds. Eighth, Botero at 15 minutes. Ninth, Serrano at 17 minutes and 23 seconds. And 10th, Garcelli at 17 minutes and 26. So of those 10, it looks like Garcelli is trying to do what he can to move up the general classification whilst the battle rages behind between Armstrong and Ulrich. Simon seems to have drifted off the pace today. We can't see much of him. So, and uh, Kivilev, I have, where's Kivilev got to, uh, Sean? Have you any idea? Because he's been forecast to riders that possibly have a go at the podium, but I've not seen much of Kivilev so far today. Have you? No, I haven't. I've seen him. I, uh well, I think his tactic will be just to stay with uh, Ulrich and Armstrong uh, onto the last climb, and uh, uh, when, you, when you get the last time, then just limit his losses because uh, you know when the uh, when the likes of Armstrong and the Ulrich starts, uh, you know, keeping his uh, their hundred percent, he's not able to follow. And we see that yesterday, and uh, I think that's you know that's all he's going to do, just follow the uh, follow those two and, and uh, limit his losses on the last climb. So I will, uh, we, you know, I don't think we'll ever see him going going away in the attacks because uh, it would not be you know it would not, it would not be really the tactic for him. He just, uh, he's just got to follow for the moment. So Bobby Julik tries to hang on then to the remnants of that 10-man breakaway group uh, that went right down in the valley. They were gone uh, way off uh, something just after about the 34-kilometre uh, mark. Uh, they went off and then uh, they are now being whittled down one by one as we climb up towards the top of the Col de Tourmalet. Well, here they are getting up toward the top of the climb. Young Montgomery here for the La Française de Jeu. Uh, still going on very well. I think there's only two teams left at the moment uh, with the, the full uh, complement of riders. And I've got an idea it might be La Française de Jeu as well. Certainly there were only two teams left with the full nine men that started out. And uh, they're coming up there very quickly indeed. We're looking back there at the uh, telecom team still round about uh, Ulrich. And Claudin is... Uh... You know, he was in the group and as I said earlier I was surprised that he got dropped from the group because he seemed to be climbing very comfortable in the earlier climbs and we see him now being caught by the uh, by the main by the main uh, the main group of Armstrong and Ulrich and you know he seems to, uh, to be going to set the pace we see I think Ulrich is yes you see Ulrich is just moving up to him now I think we will see Claude and setting a very fast pace uh, and you know they definitely have a tactic up their sleeve. Well, this race, uh, the vicious attacks between Ulrich and Armstrong have taken their toll then. The teamwork that's been going on has been fantastic to watch. There have been two teams, two strong teams, taking in turns then. There's now, uh, still, we can see the two major contenders for the crown in Paris there. Uh, at the front, going after the remnants of that ten-men breakaway group. Uh, uh, Ulrich looks over his shoulders to say thanks very much indeed uh, for what's going on, but he's still lying in there behind Cloden, who's, who's getting out. But uh, Ulrich's got to attack Cloden, suddenly goes, wow! and all the strength goes for his leg. He's looking back for a hole in that to group now so that he can get a breather and get back in and be of some use later on. 152 riders started the course today and they, once again the survivors of this great Tour de France are in for a day when they're going to have to really try to hang on in there and what's happened now? Just one to to go. These are the leaders. They might or might not be caught. Heras is still with Armstrong coming over our headphones to help uh, Armstrong as Ulrich is now trying to get away from him. In fact, I can't see Heras. The information said Heras was still there. What do you make of this then, Sh uh, Sean? Yeah, uh, Harris was there for a moment. There was four there in that group, but now we see it's just down to the two, uh, Ulrich and Armstrong. And uh, uh, you know, we we anticipated that they were going to something happen, and uh, you know, they they just uh, rode the pace and just uh, you know eliminated uh, the, that that group, the leading the part of the bunch, uh, slowly and just uh, by the rear door. And now we see Ulrich, uh, you know, in the attack, but. Um, I don't know what the, you know half the climb what the tactic is going to be because uh, you know he's not uh, he's not having caused any problems uh, to Armstrong. And also he's still riding on the on the hoods at the moment on, on the uh, brake levers because normally when Ulrich decides to give it some well he puts his hands down onto the at the bottom of the drops and then rides up from there. So although they've got rid of lots and lots of riders, I still don't think those two are riding their own particular race. And they're now catching up with the those riders who tried to go across to the men who were part of that original 10-man group. And Gartzelli will know in a minute uh, that Armstrong and Ulrich are on his tail. 
But the noise is unbelievable out there. The spectators cheering. It's not always easy for you to know what's coming on from behind because this road twists and turns. And they're now through and into there. Um, as they get the bottles here ready for the descent, there's no way they can take them on the way down. So, still, Garcelli. They're threading their way through. Yes, well, the group yes. of yes, this group of Garzelli has made contact with the with that group of uh, Arts uh, Moncoti, Belly Montgomery, uh, and of course, also in that group uh, there was Melshoff, Cardin, and Sastre. So, uh, but Ulrich has actually joined that group now. Ulrich and Armstrong. Look at this! This is fantastic. The crowd on the climb. Not only cheering their favourites, they're just cheering this battle going on before their very eyes. They've been here, some of them camping out for a couple of days now. Some started walking up this morning. Garcelli, who won the Tour of Italy last year, looks over his shoulder to watch the two contenders for the crown in Paris just ride past him. He must feel like he's been hit with a shovel. He just looked over his shoulder. He tried to go up and go into these, uh, join these uh, the rides because it was that, uh, well, it still is that 2,000 pounds, 20,000 francs for the first rider over the top. And it's not only so much getting the money, it's getting your name down in the records because uh, these big climbs, the names are written down over the years uh, that the riders have gone over the top. And this great one, the Tourmalet, to have your name over the top as uh, the winner of uh, this uh, going over the top, any priority that's up there is something you look back and say, yes, I was first over the top of the Tourmalet. The last time we were over here, it was Ellie, and the previous year, Ellie as well. And now, I think this is going to be Montgomery going away. Is it? Yes, it's Montgomery. I actually thought they were uh, uh, they were up and pulled in by the group of Galzelli, but no, they're still out in front. Uh, Montgomery, Arts, Belly, and uh, Moncuti. Well, I think uh, Belly got second spot. We'll wait for confirmation of that one, but... Uh, so it was Montgomery that went away then to add his name to that illustrious list uh, which was first there in 1910 when Lapise was first. 1911 Dubok, 1912 Dufresne, 1913 Tice, 1914 Lambeau and then it was stopped uh, for the First World War. There's not many sporting events that go back over the years that take place away from a stadium that can go back to the early 1900s and say yes we're in the same place but believe you me it's not the same sort of road and the crowds are so different when they were come out to, to the top of the climb here and often when the conditions were bad you could see the big dragon spectator just a few of them who would come up with their bikes to see the rise go over the top as Garcelli then uh, goes over there this is the famous view of the Tourmalet and that's where they're going to go down into the valley and then when they reach the bottom there'll be that final climb of the day up the top of Lutz Ardiden a climb of just under 14 kilometres Now, on the descent, um, Sean, this is going to be quite quick because they're going down a bit further than they've come up. So we're looking at uh, a descent of probably the thick end of 20 kilometres. We saw yesterday La uh, Lance Armstrong wait for uh, Ulrich when Ulrich nosedived uh, off the road and fortunately went uh, just to the edge of the Armco and dropped down into the... Uh, uh, the grass and then just into the bushes below it but there's not much in the way of bushes and grass here if you go over the top boy this must be curtains yes well uh, there is not uh, there is not a cover here on the side there's not a lot of uh, protection so uh, but the these guys just go down at the same rate and they just you, you don't think of that when you're out there you just get on with the job and you don't uh, you never worries about uh, you know the, what the consequences are if you run off well, we're talking about the downhill, and this is the profile of the descent, which you're going to see on your screens now. Those of you watching live on Eurosport, look at that very steep descent to begin with, nine percenter, then eight, then back down another nine percenter before it begins to flatten out the bottom. And I said it was 20k. In fact, it's getting on towards about 19 kilometres to the bottom. Not a bad guess. Levels out a little bit, and then down into Luxon Sauveur, and then we start to go back up again at the other side. A real roller coaster as they go down here. Sean, you did say to me that you had a when you uh, hit a four-foot wall and went over the top and down about 20 feet, uh, five feet the other side. What does it do? To, do you just lie there and say, well, that's me finished, or do you say, I must get back on my bike? Because the way in which uh, uh, Ulrich ran back up the grass with his bike on his shoulder and jumped back on again, it was like, like well, he just sort of got into a ditch, but he got to ride over the other side. How does it shake your, your uh, morale, and how does it shake your nerve for going down the rest of the descent? 
well yes on the moment when you, you know uh, when you're running out there and you know you're not going to get around the corner it is very frightening and uh, depending on what happens if you have a, if you have a bad a bad fall uh, which you know I had in the Tour of Switzerland I went over the top of a wall and I fell quite a bit uh, you're frightened for a number of weeks but then you forget it after that and you just uh, you do the same all over again uh, you know in, uh, after a number of weeks Watch him descend from the, club, uh, the uh, climb of the Tourmalet and we will keep an eye on what's happening here. You can see it too. Not much is going to change unless somebody falls off, so hold your breath and going down here. But bear in mind and spare a thought as Ulrich and Armstrong go down here. They're still climbing up the Tourmalet. A lot of other riders, including Stuart O'Grady, the Australian rider who is in the green jersey. The first ever Australian rider to take the yellow jersey in the Tour de France was Phil Anderson in 1982 when he held it for several days. He turned pro in 1980, Phil did, and uh, we're going to have a chat now to Chrissy Anderson, who's joining us in the commentary box. Uh, we would like to get the ladies' point of view, but first of all, uh, Phil has come across with a load of Australians at this show. How's his tour going this time in a car or on a bike rather than thundering down mountains like this? How's he feeling? Oh, Phil's, Phil's feeling fine. He certainly is fit. Um, he enjoys showing his, his what he considers his world to his fellow countrymen, and they certainly enjoy the stories that are never-ending on these big climbs. And I wonder, last night, didn't you have some sort of special celebration in, in Lourdes? Who turned up there, eh? Yeah, oh, we had, we had a, quite an interesting group. Everyone from uh, Sean Kelly here to Yabaskibi and um, Danny Nillison and Fred Mokassan. So we had people from all, all walks of cycling. And uh, it, it was a fantastic night. And, of course, the Australian media was there and... Uh, there was, there was a lot of good storytelling. Well, he certainly pioneered uh, the Australians coming into uh, Europe, but uh, the first one was, um, oh dear, uh, it's, 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 it's the land in John O'Gross, that the, uh, he's, let's come back to you in this, um, uh, uh, Upperman, Upperman, Hubert Upperman, he was the first Australian to come across. We've got loads of Australians coming over now. What's been the feedback? Has anybody got the feedback from Australia about our greatest performance? Oh, certainly. I mean, the, everyone is in tune with it. It's absolutely amazing the coverage that, that it's getting now um, compared to, say, 1981 when, when Phil was sort of making, making big moves. Um, now, you know, people, people you call them up and, and you want to tell them something. They say, no, 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 I'm going to watch it tonight on TV. Don't tell me. I, I, you know, we're going to get plenty of coverage here. Now, in days gone by, when Jack Goddard and Levitin were running the Tour de France, women were not allowed within 100 miles of the, of the Tour de France. How did you get involved in, in the Tour de France, and when? Well, it was 1992 when I met Phil. Um, I came over and, and basically came to the start of the event, and he handed me uh, his hotel book, and he handed me the yellow book, which is sort of our race Bible, as you know. And he said, OK, um, I'll see you every evening. And so that was my first tour, and I basically was on my own, uh, following behind this traveling circus. And, and it, at that time, it wasn't uh, really done for women to be around either. So that, that, one, that one probably created the most angst for me. But after that, I sort of got a taste for it. And I said, well, you know, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to be working. And so I started as, as a journalist. And uh, then I began slowly to get into the photography side. Now, there are more and more journalists, more and more photographers, masters, all sorts coming on from the, the uh, uh, female side. We've got a statistic coming up in a minute. Uh, uh, there's lots of wait for that to come, I think. Uh, it should pop up in just a moment. We'll come back. I'd like to find more, I'm sure some of our viewers are watching going down here. A bit more from the ladies' point of view and those that you speak to on the tour. And right, so here we're coming up for, for Mike Smith back in Paris, who's sitting on his own in a little cubicle with no nice lady to talk to. Are you there, Mike? <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that, David, because because I'd like you to extend my best wishes to Krista. I, I remember her being my driver once on the um, the Leeds Classic. I'm sure she'll remember a few years ago when I was one of the commentators up on Holm Moss and uh, I had the pleasure of being driven around the course by her that day. Anyway, nice to hear from her. Yes, the updated King of the Mountains ranking. Laurent Jalabert firmly ensconced there, still top of the pile. The other Laurent, Laurent Rooks, still in second place. Now remember, they haven't scored recently and Ulrich and Armstrong up on the top of the Tourmalet, they've both scored points there, being not too far behind Sven Montgomery, who took uh, the first place at the top. So they've moved a little bit closer, but Laurent Jalabert, he, he still has that very, very big gap. Well, there we are, those uh, two descending here, and we've been trying to get the women's point of view regarding the Tour de France. Yes, more and more are coming on the tour right now, and uh, what's the general feeling about this? Is there any, what's the fear to the athletic endeavour? But looking here, if when 
men go out bike racing, they know the, the, the problems that go on, but looking at it, particularly if somebody uh, who's got a, a ride there, who's a boyfriend, uh, maybe their son, maybe their husband or something, just how can you sort of distance yourself from it, or do you get, oh my God, look what's happening now? How's it from well, women's point of view? You, you probably can't get enough of it. Um, personally, I used to, to watch it on television, um, even the classics on television on, on Eurosport, because the coverage was so good and so live that I felt I felt more connected that way than possibly standing on the side of the road. There's nothing more frustrating than having your, your partner or, or loved one or son um, come by you and look like they're in strife and, and you can't do anything about it. Or, or um, as I'm watching them descend this mountain, I'm, I'm noticing the lack of, of helmets, and of course that that's something that was a big bug um, in our in our household. Was the you know, are you going to be wearing your helmet or not? And uh, he was always, of course, doing it. <laughs> Sean is making jumped up and down. You, you want to say something, Sean? You were certainly gesticulating. I think it's the right word for it, Sean. Well, we all have that David in our career. <laughs> what being told off for not wearing your helmet? Yes, always the helmet was. Uh, uh, it was a major problem, especially for me and for Phil. We started our career and we did not have to wear helmets. And then the UCI brought in a rule uh, that we had to wear helmets. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a strike. But it's difficult to change. But I think uh, if you start off from underage as a junior wearing a helmet, then it's much easier. But when you come to an event like this and you haven't been used to wearing a helmet and then you have to do it in these mountains, it, it just boils the head off you. But I think for safety, I think, uh, and it should be, uh, you know, it should be a regulation by the UCI that everybody has to wear a helmet. But the biggest problem I had when I was using in the tours, um, you start off a mountain, you start climbing, and you're there with guys who haven't got a helmet, and you're there, you're under pressure, and the head, the head is burning off you, and that is the hardest point. But I think if everybody has to wear it, well, then everybody is, uh, you know, so, has, yeah. has got the same handicap. Well, glad you brought that up. I have no, no doubt many of the people rushing to their emails to come through, there'll be loads of emails. Sons riding and wearing helmets, and this and that. you've got little then? Yeah, we have a, we have a small one, um, an 18-month-old baby. Go on the time the tour down under, Phil. Yeah, yeah, Phil was at a bike race. So yeah, he was supposed to be doing the commentary about the television. We say, where are you going, Phil? He said, ah, oh, back to the birth of a son. He's gone. Yeah, yeah, but he came back to the bike race. So, uh, so, so even though we tried to thwart uh, that happening during his career, it, it still happened. You know, he was still at a bike bike race when the baby was born. But, now, uh, are you going to encourage uh, what's his name? Aiden. Aiden. You're going to encourage Aiden to to uh, take to bike, or we let him uh, make his own decision? I, I think Aiden's quite a lot like his dad, and I don't think there's going to be encouraging or discouraging him from anything he wants to do. He'll he'll just do what he wants. He's he's very very uh, focused child. Now you've been living up in the bush in Australia, as I understand, so whacking snakes over the head with shovels and things like that from what we heard recently. Uh, but, but by the way, ladies, they're not living out in a shack. They've got quite a decent ranch out there. You're moving down to the, the coast as well. What's the plan for yourself and, uh, and Phil in the future? What, do you see yourself doing what you're doing now, or you say, well, this is what we'd like to do? Well, we're still um, developing the Phil Anderson series, which is a series of tours and training camps, both within Australia and overseas. Um, he's doing a tour to the tour here, and that's one element of our of our program. Um, I, of course, have my photography and adventure stuff um, that I'm doing. But the property itself will also have an earn, earning ability by, um, we'll be making cottages and things like that for rent. Well, we wish you the best of luck then. Thanks for joining us here, and at night, have a ladies' info. We'll see you later on during the tour. Thanks so much indeed. Bye. On this stage 14, then 144 kilometres uh, from Tarp to Lutz Ardidem. We've been over uh, two fourth carry climbs, one third carry climb. They were in the early part of the race uh, in the first, uh, what, 40 kilometres or so. And then we climbed over the Col de Aspan, down into the valley, and we've just been over the top of the famous Col de Tourmalet. It's split on the Col de Tourmalet, and uh, they're coming back together on the descent, but uh, Sean, you can just put us in the picture, if you can, because they're all over the place at the moment, on what has happened, and uh, going back over the top of the Tourmalet, uh, at the summit there, there were four lives away on that particular occasion. Julik was 42nd behind the Gartelli, like say, Capote, the whole gang arrives, including Ulrich and Armstrong. But how's it looking now as we're getting towards uh, the last 25 kilometres? 
well over the top of the Tumalay. Uh, Montgomery was first over, uh, Belly second, and Moncati was third. And uh, on, on the sense, uh, there was uh, uh, there were four riders. Uh, there was Mario Ars, Moncati, Belly, and Montgomery. But Montgomery has lost a bit on the descent. He's lost 20 seconds on these uh, on the other three. And uh, then we have the we had the the main group of Ulrich Armstrong and a lot of the other favourites at 58 seconds. But uh, they haven't uh, they have been riding uh, uh, very very hard in this in this chasing group of Armstrong and Ulrich. So there's a lot of riders coming back. There's riders uh, uh, you know making up ground and come back into this group. So it's grown all the time. And I reckon there's about 25 riders in the group now. And I think uh, the riders coming back they will attack before the last climb to, here to lose out his end. Just get some advantage before the bottom of the climb because uh, the bottom of the climb is very steep. The first two three k's are very very hard, and I think it's uh, it's a little bit easier than it levels off a bit. So that will be the hard the hardest part of climb to get settled in in the first uh, in the first number of kilometres. And we see here we have the three leaders of uh, Arts, Moncotti and Belly. Well, they are regrouping the bottom, and uh, what going in was 15 seconds was Montgomery's lead at the top then, and. Uh, now, as they're going to sort of slightly rise up towards the next a bit, the gap for uh, not really enough to stay away, do you think? Uh, for these three, well, Montgomery actually he went over the top a little bit ahead, but he was caught here. We see him now, he's behind those three leaders, uh, so he's the fourth man on the road, and he's roughly about uh, 20 seconds behind the three uh, three lead away riders. But uh, the gap 58 seconds, uh, you know, it's nothing uh, when they start the bottom of the climb, even if they get to a minute and a half, two minutes, uh, when Ulrich and uh, Armstrong and the other uh, the, the good climbers. Uh, uh, we have we, we have some of the good climbers. Cardenas is also in this group, and you know he's a guy who can climb very well. So uh, uh, the guys who are not really up in the general who are good climbers, I think we will see them attacking the early part, and uh, they might be allowed to take an advantage uh, if there's a rivalry between Armstrong and Ulrich. They start looking at each other in the beginning of the climb here to lose at the end. Well, I've just heard the one minute 15 seconds uh, for these uh, leading riders back to the group containing uh, Ulrich and Armstrong, and this is the profile of the course showing you where they've got to go. As uh, it just starts quite steadily, 5.5%, they go the day, but look at that thumping great 10% uh, just after they've gone through the first uh, five kilometres. And then it levels off in called the 8.6, 8.5, levelling up to 6. But look again, between the ninth kilometre and up to the 11th, it goes back up to 9, so just here, just spare a thought for that, and then up to 7%. Now, the interesting thing is with this particular course is that uh, uh, from the bottom, almost as soon as you uh, start the climb, you can look up in the distance and you see it zigzagging all the way up. In fact, it probably was about kilometre three, I think, wasn't it, Sean, where we could actually see the big screen at the top here, where all the people are watching uh, it on the big screen. So we'll probably get the, the camera flicking up there, but if they look up these riders, is that going to sort of... Uh, Hit him in the in the uh, uh, in the skull with oh my goodness! Are we coming to another statistic? They have loads of these, by the way. So I'll ask Sean again, what it's like if they dare to look up, or we're going to put your head down because I think most of this coming in. This might be Mike Smith back there. You can't see a blind thing out of his commentary point. Uh, whereas we're sitting here, gorgeous sunshine round about, and the smell of the crotches of the cars that are coming up here. I can smell burnt cork, and it's smelling there because they've been coming up here uh, on the, a boiling hot day up toward the top of the finish of. Stage 14, 144 kilometres, 90 miles in all, to the top of Lutz Ardiden. It's funny you should mention burning clutches, David, because I, there was an email which we haven't got round to a few days ago asking how come all these cars don't burn their clutches out. You might want to comment on that. Uh, but seriously, five finishes in recent times anyway in Lutz Ardiden. Richard Veron back in 94, the great Big Mig in 1990. Another email asked what's happened to him, by the way. Somebody wants to know what's happened to Mig since he retired. Laudelino Cubino in 88, Dag Otto Lauritsen back in 87, and Pedro Delgado, a former winner of the tour, like Miguel Lindrain, of course, was first up to Luz Adiden back in 1985. Well, there we are. You see, that's the run down on there. And uh, I've said to myself here that God giveth and God taketh away. Uh, in some particular instance here, God giveth us the chance to come in now, because this is a ski resort, and they've uh, made the road so that we can come up here uh, on these mountain top finish, which you couldn't do like in 1910 in the days when we went over the other two big climbs a day at the Col d'Aspen and over to the Col de Tourmalet. The roads were almost impossible, but they, they battled their way over them. But uh, now with the ski resorts at the top, then these roads are made for the uh, people in the winter to come out skiing. And not only for the uh, roads going up, but at the space at the top then, 
uh, for the uh, Tour de France organisers to put uh, the great uh, gather gathering of vehicles uh, for the people working on the tour. And also, you imagine getting all the team cars up, parking them, and getting them back down again as well. It's a, it's a magnificent piece of organisation. Whereas, as I say, God take it away. In some of the towns now we used to go through, they're very difficult because of the street furniture and the uh, chicanes there, the sleeping policemen, the traffic lights, uh, the many things which make it difficult for uh, races, not only here in France, but also back in Great Britain, to go through town centres. So the place where the race is best to see, is best to take part, where really the decisions are made, is out in the country, out in the mountains, and this is going to be, Sean, possibly the final decision day in the Tour de France, if only uh, Armstrong can keep uh, Ulrich back, that gap between those two riders at the moment. Uh, if they can just keep this gap, then it will let go of the shouting and just down to lesser riders, or is this the time when we still have a chance to look forward to a change into Paris? And me, this is going to be the final nutcracker. What do you think? Yes, it definitely is. I think today is a day that you uh, uh, that you can find the tracks in uh, uh, in the yellow jersey and in Armstrong, and uh, you know it's the day to try everything. And uh, you know they're definitely doing that. We see Gurin; he's setting a pace here, a uh, very very fast pace at the bottom of Luz Saldudin. Uh, so uh, they're definitely the US. Uh, they're definitely testing the US posters and uh, Armstrong today. Great ride here by number 62 at the back here, that's the rider from the uh, Lotto team, still hanging on there, Mario Ertz, the Belgian. We're going back down now to the uh, champion of France, Bruce, with 12 kilometres to go in that breakaway group too. If we go back up there, uh, we've had Belly and Montgomery. Where's Montgomery got to now at the moment, Sean? He seems to take a bit of a pace. Yes, well, Montgomery lost uh, a bit of time on the descent. He lost 15, 20 seconds. So he's uh, he's ahead of Roos on the road here. And, uh, uh, you know, he, we, we should see him being pulled in by Roos very, very quickly. And uh, uh, the, the leading uh, group uh, was at around a minute to a minute 15, uh, about a kilometre or further down the time. So it's Moncuti and Belly away down the road being chased by Montgomery and Roos now here. Uh, trying to do something, but this is the easy part of the slope. Mass of the people out, by the way, we're seeing also many people with bicycles with numbers on. There were seven and a half thousand riders. Uh, it was, I think, on Friday they came along here. They took part in the attack to tour. They turned up and rode the course to ride exactly the same course you're seeing today. And I had a little note here from the uh, Congleton Cycling Club from Graham Wally uh, called Team Lard, Keith Wright from Team Lard, and John and Len and Jeff. All out there from the uh, Congleton Cycling Club. They did it inside the eight hours. By the way, they told me a little note, that's why I'm happy to have it here from them. I'm happy to have any notes, by the way, if we can get round to them, is that uh, it actually snowed on the Etape de Tour, on top of the Tourmalet when they came over there this year. And those who took part in the Etape de Tour last year, they had snow on the Bantu and a terrible wind and it iced over and they couldn't all manage to get over there. So you can imagine many of the spectators you're seeing here have ridden this uh, Etape de Tour. We've seen young riders, old riders, who just had to go out there and come across this famous route that's now being ridden by these riders in the 88th Tour de France. And France, by the way, when they select eight teams to ride the tour a lot of people going top 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 me included when we had all those eight teams coming in they put in something like 51 French riders against 35 uh, last year but Sean to me these French riders whilst they're not at the moment uh, got a rider in yellow we have had their starting out uh, Mollo in the yellow jersey and we saw Simon batting with the yellow jersey too but they've got uh, in the polka dot jersey Lanot Jalabert stage winner taking that polka dot jersey too as well and I think we have to say uh, going into this uh, uh, final day in the Pyrenees that the French riders have really been going hard this year hard I've seen them for the last couple of years Yes, uh, they definitely have been uh, you know, performing well. I think they have, have had a very good tour. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, too many French teams were selected by the, uh, by the society to tour, but I think uh, they have answered all those questions. And as you said, you know, we had more in the beginning, but also... Uh, you know, with some of the smaller teams like a Bonjour was, you know, very, very, uh, very, they had a, 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 a fabulous tour, AG2R, they won a stage, uh, CAC, of course, they had, you know, they, they had an, an unbelievable tour with Jalabert, so all the teams that got uh, wildcard invitations, they have, uh, they have performed very well.
and we've now got some traditional French uh, Tour de France weather on this uh, day when it's the final day in the big mountains. It ain't over yet. I haven't seen any fat lady singing at the top of this climb, but certainly uh, the one man here to that fat who has been accused in the past of not coming in for tour, properly tuned up, uh, carrying too much weight, Jan Ull. This year he rode uh, the Tour of Italy, came in much sharper this year, and he's given us a real great race so far. These three hanging on, that's Belly here, number 44, you can see, and Hertz on the right-hand side uh, with the number 62. Number 77, Moncuti, desperately trying to hang on here, cheered on by this multinational crowd. A lot of French, maybe the majority of French, but at the near the top, one gets the impression there's nobody living in the Basque country any longer. The orange shirts cheering on the Escatel or Escadi team, who were one of the wild card selections for the Tour de France this year. They've written their hearts out, the young lads from the Oescadi or Escadel team. Uh, their top place rider is Shallow. He's lying 16th overall. No disrespect in that one. The team has fought and fought and fought, and the final fight is being acted here in the mountains uh, before we get down into the undulating stages after rest day tomorrow. And look, the French champion is giving it all. What a great ride. Well, I'm also hearing back there that Lysaka, who rides for the Oescatel team, is with a, a, a team, a group of riders that includes uh, Botero, who was the King of the Mountains last year. So, in fact, there's two of the orange jerseys from the Oescatel team just going up. In fact, they're starting to move up toward the front. They've, they've been, uh, to me, uh, Sean, a little chirpy lot like Kelmer used to be. They've been in a great race, haven't they? This is their territory. Yes, they certainly have uh, rode a very, uh, a very active race. They've been attacking a lot, and uh, they have been a bit unlucky, really, not to win a stage. Uh, and you know, we will, uh, I think, uh, you know, we will see him here. But I think it's, uh, it's a little bit late for him to be attacking now because, uh, you know, to, to pull out an advantage against Armstrong and Ulrich is going to be very difficult. A number of seconds, 10, 15 seconds, is going to be the maximum. I think if, he, if there was one of those guys from the Escatel team up at this break, well then uh, they would have a, have a chance because they have some very, very good climbers in their team. Okay. They're still Ulrich following on behind Garini, who seems to have got his breath back. But fascinating this tour in the mountains. Many of these, like uh, um, Cloden had got, Garini is a very good climber to be with him. Livingston came to be with him, and uh, they built the team up of some good climbers and also had to recognize they needed some men for the flat. Armstrong did the same thing as well, but they're especially his climbers. I mean, Harris has had a few bad days for various reasons. Hamilton had a few bad days. Livingston, in fact, the, the specialist climbers from sickness or injury haven't always been there every day, have they? So I think, would you say the telecom team and US postal team have been evenly matched in problems? Yes, I definitely think they've had, uh, both of the teams had their, had their problems and, uh, you know, through crashes and through, through injury, uh, as you said, you know, there was, uh, and, and also stomach problems. So I think they've had a fair, uh, a, a pretty fair dose of their, uh, of their bad look, let's call it. So it's, kind of, it's, it's pretty much leveled out over, but uh, a lot of talk about in the beginning, the US postal team, they, you know, Harris was having a lot of problems and uh, Rubel also had a knee problem and there was a lot of talk about that, that, you know, they weren't going to go through the tour maybe they wouldn't finish uh, the tour when they hit the mountains but they all came through very well they suffered on and uh, I think the, you know uh, it, it panned out pretty even uh, for the two teams and uh, you know it's 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 really been uh, uh, the teams are pretty well matched I suppose in the end of the day and it's just down to man to man in the final and you know Armstrong has been the strongest on, on that of course stomach problems Sean it must be the Biet Noir it's a jolly good uh, Irish word the Biet Noir the bike rider eh? Yes, well, the stomach problems is, you know, it's always a risk because, uh, you know, when you're very, very fit, you're very prone to getting uh, uh, getting sick and uh, getting a stomach bug. And the problem is, uh, you know, when you're out on the road there, uh, one of the most dangerous things when, you, uh, when you're when you climbing and it's, when it's very, very warm, somebody hands you up uh, a bottle of water and you drink from it. It's a very dangerous thing because you don't know where the water is after coming from. And that's uh, that's one of the most dangerous things for the cyclists. And normally the riders, they just, they just splash it over the head and they never drink that water. Only the, only the bottle that was given from the team cars. And of course, let's take bottle of water at the hotels too. If you're taking the tap, which you shouldn't do, it's changing all the time because they're going all across the whole of France. The water's changed, the food's changed as well. And you've got to keep riding your bike for 21 days out of uh, 23. Unbelievable stamina, these riders. Ten kilometers to go, but... Uh, the leaders in this race having their own private battle to try and get the stage victory, but further back down here, Armstrong and uh, Ulrich, 
they're having their own head-to-head. -head. One minute five is the coming back from the three riders in the lead. Three riders in, Etz, Moncuti and Belly. Uh, that lead then being whittled down all the way through as uh, our main contenders for the crown here move on inside the final 10 kilometres. And as you said, uh, the Spanish riders are very active. We see the Escatel rider, Leseki, he's, he's went in the attack there and uh, he went away from this group of Ulrich Armstrong, very, very strong. And we've also seen uh, a Banesto rider who attack. So the Spanish are definitely you know, out to do something today because uh, you know, they're very close to their home and uh, they have a, a huge amount of Spanish supporters on this final climb. And the Spanish being very much related to the uh, Colombians too. We've got a Colombian up there, Botero, wearing 151 for the Calme team. We'll try and pick up some of the numbers so the helicopter can uh, pick them up. You can follow them too. 117 lays taker there. I did get an email. We've had loads in, but the race has been so active. It's difficult for us to go into the emails. Uh, and uh, I know some people say, well, thank goodness for that. But they do bring out very often some interesting points which we may not be thinking about. And the one that this uh, particular email was, as now we get back up to Delhi here, uh, was uh, why can't they print the numbers of the riders in the... Um in, in the programs, uh, the monthly program, particularly the official one from British Eurosport. The problem is that it was printed uh, weeks, well, not about uh, two, ten days to two weeks before the race started, and you can only put down the selections of riders you think will be riding in uh, monthly magazines. And the same thing then, even with us, the commentary bill, we will get a rundown on maybe, uh, what, 12 riders of the nine, um, and we don't know what the numbers are, and they don't issue those numbers until it's uh, they've had all the riders signed on, uh, medically cleared and then uh, that's proper medical and not just seeing that they've been taken naughty they actually take them through all sorts of tests uh, lung tests blood tests uh, uh, just to make sure they are physically fit to ride the uh, the tour and then only then are official uh, numbers issued to the the teams and the ride off then goes Laseka pass number 62 which is that and number 77 Moncouti on left hand side so I'm sorry it can't be printed for you I suggest probably some of the uh, websites and I've never had time to check the Eurosport website will probably have the list of starters on there and I hope with the numbers but if anybody hasn't done that it's a bit late now to do it but I think in future years it might be a useful thing so even if you haven't got a computer you can get in touch with one of your mates that does and rate it for the numbers if um, the only thing where you can get the numbers from if it's not been printed in the weekly sighting press because obviously we don't see those from out here is that the newspaper they keep um, which is the same organisation as the Tour de France. They come out uh, with uh, a story about the race every day, and they keep can be uh, obtained in London, for instance. Lots of the um, shops in London, news agent shops around about places like uh, Hannington Station, New, uh, New Cross, and so on. Those uh, those uh, news agents do have copies that they keep. In fact, I get. They keep uh, from a news agent in Bath. It comes in 24 hours late, but I go there and I book it and they uh, send it, they've got it put on side for me. And then when I come from uh, the newspaper shop, I can have the update information really going into the Tour de France. Yes, I have got a computer, there are things in there, but I also like to get Le Keep. It has lots of little side stories you can't pick up elsewhere. And there they do have in Le Keep every day uh, the start list of the riders and lines through those that have not made it so far. So it's even worthwhile trying to make a, a trip into a major town and asking a news even your local news agent by the way in some of the bigger towns might be able to order it for you because some of the wholesalers can get it you may come up a few days later but it does give you the numbers which can only appear virtually as now as uh, Armstrong starts to go Rivera started to go Armstrong started to go Leisaker's trying to win the stage now and um, they are now about to do what we've seen them do so often in the last uh, few days in fact we've had five days of back to back mountain tuck finishing something I haven't seen for a long time in the Tour de France but it still seems to be going at a I won't say modest pace uh, sure but a contained pace eh? yes it's uh, it is uh, uh it is a steadier pace, and uh, you know we see the Royals were still hanging in that group. Uh, but you know we, when we see, uh, when we, I think when the guys see the uh, uh, the US forces and Rubel are taking the front, uh, they're definitely getting more than because we have seen that in, on a few occasions in the past where Rubel uh, uh, just sets the pace and then Armstrong does his thing. And I think a lot of riders are going to say, well, you know, how long more is it going to last? Uh, we're going to last here before Armstrong uh, going to the attack. 
And what about Billy then, having had that problem in the Tour of Italy? He must be feeling quite confident now. He's had a pretty slow start to Tour, but uh, still looks like he's going to be up there in the what, top half dozen today on the stage, or has he got something overtaken after being in that long, lone breakaway? I think it'll be difficult for him to stay out there. Uh, you know, this group and they start to go, there will a number of those guys catch up to uh, to Belly, and, uh, you know, Lesecki is definitely coming up, uh, uh, coming quickly as well, if he can keep it going. It's a long ways to the top, but still, uh, I think uh, we should be around the eight kilometres, so a long, long ways, and, you know, a very, very difficult climb all the way. Uh, so uh, it's going to be difficult for Lesecki as well to keep this to keep, to keep this going. And if Armstrong, uh, you know, uh, attacks this group in the next uh, two or three kilometres, it would be very virtually impossible for anybody to stay away from him. What do you have to do then when you say attacks? Do you have to try and go at his speed or just go to say, I'll stay at this speed and hope he comes back? Or can you accelerate with them? I mean, Armstrong seems to be the, uh, the best at this surge of speed. And I think was, uh, Pantani was another one that could do that, could ride the pace and then suddenly go down the road by going up a, a notch and then sort of sitting back and go up another notch. Is that something you practice and train for or is it a gift? Well, I think it's a, it's a bit of a gift to have. It's you know it's, it's a natural thing, and uh, you know Lance had that from the beginning. And there's a lot of talk about the way he can uh, the way he can attack. But I remember when he became professional, uh, you know he was uh, his acceleration was great. He was able to turn the gear very very fast. Uh, the difference now, I think, is he's got done a lot of weight. When he started his career, he had maybe two kilos or two kilos plus, and that makes so much of a difference when you get the weight down. And you, and you know now now he's he's you know he's really uh, he's really got. The way it down and he's in, he's in just in top in top condition and uh, but he, he always had that fast rhythm of pedaling and I don't think there's anything new and of course uh, Pantani was another guy who had it and you know if you have that well then uh, you know it's, 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 it's a natural thing it's a huge advantage when you arrive in a climb like this after climbing three or four mountains beforehand. Well, Pantani was like half a yard of pump water. There was nothing of him. Just this uh, slim chap who would uh, have a gift for climbing and would go out and win a couple of stages in the uh, uh, Tour de France. Uh, he's not with us now because his team wasn't riding strong enough, but uh, uh, we all said, oh, well, well, perhaps we might miss him in the, in the climb. But we haven't because uh, Armstrong and uh, Ulrich have certainly entertained us in the climb. Plus, the, like you're seeing here on your screen now, uh, the Escatel Escati team, one of the wildcard teams into the Tour de France. They say here uh, now going away uh, to do what he knows best that's uh, to climb the mountains they come if you go out to the Basque country it's not a place that many people go on holiday to by the way but uh, in the Basque country there's a proliferation of top cyclists and in fact so many of the Basques have made their way into other uh, uh, teams in uh, Spain as well uh, they eventually decided to form their own team some years ago and now they've been rewarded then by sponsorship from Escatel to give them enough money to build the team up uh, put the management background into as well and there's Gifted climbers now as he comes up towards Belly, who's had, uh, well, disappointment in the Tour of Italy when uh, he got uh, flung off the race for punching a spectator who's verbally abusing everybody. And uh, Belly was looking for, I think, a better placing in the Tour de France, but certainly today he's given it everything to try and get a stage victory. We're heading up towards, you see the Basque flag on the left-hand side, the red, white and green flag. You're seeing the orange jerseys here. No, they're not Dutch supporters. Uh, over the years, the orange shirts would have said it's the Dutch supporters. And certainly we saw the Dutch supporters in orange on the climb up the Alpe d'Huez. But now, these climbs in the Pyrenees, the orange coloured jerseys, T-shirts and sometimes orange hair is, as we see, the orange cargo on the left-hand side. This is the Orescatel, Orescati time, and Leiseka going off down the road, really trying to bury himself to get the stage victory. Mike Smith back in um, in, in Paris there. You're a Leiseka supporter, aren't you? What do you think of this so far? Oh, I'm, th I'm absolutely thrilled, David. He's had some excellent performances during May and June in his lead-up to the Tour de France uh, as the t one of the top men in the Orescatel team. He had 10 places in the top ten. He's still out of victory, but he's always been there or thereabouts. He's been threatening to do it, and now I'm just wondering whether he's got enough in hand, maybe, to uh, stave off what I think, and you probably agree, will be the expected challenge higher up the climb from Armstrong and Ulrich. My fingers are crossed for him. And Mike, uh, many of the 
uh, smaller Spanish races. I mean, I got the season up uh, with, oh, it's been what it was now. We do so many Spanish races, and in uh, my recovery time, you've been doing them as well. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, how do you rate all these Spanish riders this year? It certainly seems to me they've got more strength in depth than we've seen before. Yes, there's no question about it. You've got the two Echabarias, unrelated, but both redoubtable riders, David particularly. Incidentally, he celebrates his birthday tomorrow, one of three riders celebrating a birthday on the second rest day, but that's uh, today's piece of useless information for you anyway. Uh, but have returns to David Echabarria. Uh, but Lyseka, of course, we've seen what he's doing now. Inigo Shoro, um, he's featured several times in uh, recent days. Um, he's had about half a dozen placings in the top ten. He was uh, uh, very, very well placed in the Dauphine Libere, came eighth in the time trial stage of the Dauphine Choro, and we've seen him chancing his arm a few times in the last few days in the mountains, but just look now at the determination here being shown by this man, Roberto Lysaka. Well, the... Um I'm just, uh, thanks for saying that, Mike. Give me a chance to dive into my computer, which is back full of bits of paper. And uh, one of the magazines, Cycle Sport, had, um, in the Tour de l'Avenir, looking back to last year, they had this great big heading across the top. It said, the future's orange. You know, the, the people said, the future's bright, the future's orange. That's one of the, uh, I think, the, the telephone people. They're actually on the race, too, as well. The future's bright. And said, in the Tour de l'Avenir, many Tour de France, they to go by, expect uh, Escatel or Escadi to brighten up the race in future. Well, they've been doing just that uh, because uh, one of their riders, uh, Flores, won the Tour de l'Avenir, which is the race for the up and coming young riders, and it happens, uh, I think, after the Tour of France, and it's mainly for riders sort of around about the 23 years of age. And that, on that particular occasion, the orange jerseys were out there uh, for the uh, Escatel team, and certainly they, they opened people's eyes. And it's good to see them out there, it's good to see new teams coming through, and I think they're justifying their wild uh, card selection by the organisation of the Tour de France. Now then, we've been rabbiting on, Mike and myself, by the Escatel team, because I'd like to give the other dogs a bit of a shout. Sean, your view of what's happening now? Well, uh, Lasecki is definitely, uh, he's going very, very strong. The gap is about 1.15 uh, all the time, so, uh, you know, uh, considering the uh, pace that the US posters are setting, and Rubera, he's, you know, uh, going at quite a, quite a strong pace because, you see, Royal is going out the back, uh, you know, Gavzelli getting dropped, and Merckx, uh, they're just, they're just, uh, they're reeling off the names here, so, the, you know, the pace is quite hot in the group, but Lasecki, uh, you know, uh, he's quite a rele rele elevation this year, really, and, uh, you know, we haven't had a lot of him before and he's uh, you know 32 years of age he seems to come into his prime in, the, in um, later I, I, I'm not sure how long he's been professional but uh, you know certainly if he can win here today it would be a, it would be a huge thing for the uh, for the SKTL team with so much of their uh, best supporters and Spanish supporters here on this uh, last mountain it's quite interesting that actually Sean you mentioned about the age of the lads so uh, dear viewers just let me uh, go down that route while Sean to make sure that nothing blows apart while I'm reading the, the small print here the Escatel team uh, um, the age group and their participation, David Echeverria is 28, four times he's ridden the Tour de France, uh, Cast Castasana is 29, this is the first time he's ridden the Tour de France, Shallow is 29, he's only ridden the Tour de France once before, uh, Echeverria, Una Echeverria is 29, He's only ridden the Tour de France once before. Uh, Leiseka is 31. He's never ridden the Tour de France before. Lopez de Munion is 29. He's never ridden the Tour de France before. And the young man, Zabeleda, he's 24, and he's never ridden the Tour de France before. And two other riders who've uh, retired from the race that uh, uh, Flores, I mentioned before, earlier on in both performance in the Tour de l'Avenir. He hadn't ridden the Tour de France either before, nor the other rider who got chucked off the race for the high hemocrit level. He'd never ridden the Tour de France before. So what <laughs> Make of that short, that they've got one, two, three, four, five riders started the race, never ridden the Tour de France before, even with other teams, and only David Echebier, who'd ridden it three times before, to come into this race. How difficult is it, not only for the riders, but the, the team management to adjust to a very complex race like this? Well, I think the team management have a job uh, a job on their hand when they are riders like that, and I think Gorospe, uh, he's you know, a very good hand at that, a, a huge amount of experience, uh, pro for a, a long number of years himself. Did you race for this? 
Yes, I raced with Julian Grosby for many years, and you know he rode the Tour, uh, Tour of France, Tour of Spain. He, I, he, I think he rode all the big tours. Uh, so you know the guys like the and the names you said that uh, came into the Tour for the first time. Uh, you know he would be uh, uh, telling them what to do exactly. And like Seki actually we see yesterday on the last climb he didn't feel up to it and he lost a huge amount of time. And that was you know uh, thinking about today. I think he was resting himself. So uh, and he's out here today. And he's given everything now. So it's that was a planned thing, I suppose, by by Grosby and himself. Well, what a day we've got. Last day in the mountains, and it's full of incident. Billy battling to try and stay up to the front of this race, but Lysik has gone straight past him, looking for a victory at Lutzard again. This is the group containing Lance Armstrong, who's managed to pull up a couple of his teammates to defend that yellow jersey. And behind is Ulrich then, five kilometres to go towards the finish. And, well, it's unfortunate that the cameras haven't come back down or the helicopter haven't taken us up the mountain with a zigzag towards the top we may get it later on so if you can hang on with us now it's five past of um, or ten past five central european time ten past four for those watching on british eurosport it just looks nice and calm here with the green trees doesn't it and a very uh, relaxed crowd here a bit thin on the ground at this particular point but if the cameras move up uh, and uh, we can get off the helicopter you'll be able to see this uh, this Ascension towards the top of the climb, it zigzags backwards and forwards, and the massive number of spectators there. And many of them, I think, are going to, if they're going back to work tomorrow, we might have to have a day off because they'd be cooked bien cuit. I think it is in France, as some of my colleagues uh, want to uh, have their steaks bien cuit, not me, I prefer it to Seignon, but uh, today every spectator on the side of those is going to be bien cuit, I can assure you, and some of the riders further down the uh, mountain, uh, way off the back, will be also very bien cuit. Yes, uh, we see uh, Lasecki. He's getting a, uh, you know, encouragement from the car, from the car, and he's probably getting his time advantage that he, that he has on Armstrong Ulrich, and so they're giving him an encouragement all the time and giving him time checks. And we see uh, on the front of the bunch there, we see Heras who took up the, uh, took over the pace, uh, the pace making from Ribera. So uh, I think we will see Armstrong, you know, starting to uh, starting to do his uh, his usual uh, that he's, we've seen him doing so many times over the last uh, in the Alps and also in the Pyrenees and. Uh, we see Kibalev also, he was in trouble there, he was losing contact with uh, with Moncotti. And Roos, he tried to go, looks like he's going out the back too as well, eh? Yes, he's, uh, he definitely he definitely had a go, uh, and you know he tried to to get the gap before he got the climb, but uh, you know he just didn't uh, he, he he didn't climb the hill well enough. Uh, uh, he wasn't strong enough, but you know you can't. Uh, at least he tried, and that's. Uh, that's uh, I suppose the director had. Uh, you know that was the plan, and when your when your director says you have to go for it, well then you just do it and do your best. But if you're not on, a, on the best of a day, well then you know it is no way you can uh, it can work out. Well, interesting. The mother with a side uh, story, by the way, because uh, the uh, rather uh, Joan Samariba, who last year won the. The tour of uh, France for women and the tour of Italy too as well. Uh, she's married for uh, married to Gonzalez Arieta, who also rides for this uh, lads in orange as well. So they're a very great cycling family too. It's a way of life for that family. It's a way of life for the backs that Basques too. There's an atmosphere in uh, all countries towards cycling. But Sean, you've ridden uh, based yourself in Belgium. Uh, you've uh, been riding in all that's about every European country. What's the atmosphere like as you're riding with the cast? Team, for instance, which was a sponsored team from uh, Spain. What's the atmosphere like riding in Spain uh, amongst the Spanish riders and living amongst the Spanish spectators? Well, I, th you know, I did a number of years with the cast and I did a lot of the Spanish races, uh, the Tour of Spain, I did them uh, quite a number of times, but also the smaller races, uh, the Tour of Pays Basque and the Tour of Catalonia, the Sundan Catalan, and it has a huge following down there. And over the last, uh, uh, when I was competing, it, gets, it was getting a lot of TV coverage, and uh, you know, there's a lot of smaller Spanish teams uh, who uh, ride a lot, all the races uh, in Spain, and uh, you know, we see these riders coming in here now with the Escatel team, and names we haven't seen before, never competed in the Tour of Fans, but they're able to compete at that top level and it just shows that there's very good racing in Spain and they have some very good riders down there that don't uh, uh, that don't compete outside of Spain a lot because they're in some of the smaller Spanish teams. Well, the Spaniards out in force here then, urging on this man and uh, going back to our little notes here just to remind us that this man is no spring chicken, Laiseka, uh, 31 years of age and uh, 
Is this the one Mike you said is coming up to his birthday tomorrow? No, that's David, David Echebarria, David. Um, oh, right. David is one of three riders, just to very quickly tell you. Jörg Yaksha uh, in the Once team, uh, one of the leading young riders. He is 25 years of age tomorrow. Rick Verbrugge, the Belgian who rides for Lotto, will be 27 tomorrow. And David Echebarria, would you believe it, is 28 tomorrow. Right, so I'm just flicking through uh, my book here to see that Leiseka, uh, he it was born the 17th of uh, the 6th, 1969. So that, in fact, uh, makes him... Is that 32, isn't it? He's gone through his 32nd birthday uh, in June this year. My note said 31, but he's now 32 in uh, June. 17, 6, uh, 17th of June, 1969. Does that make it 32, Mike? I'm getting a bit sort of here. You know, you're still all together, David. 32 is correct. Well, you see, they give us lots of information, and obviously they didn't realise that by the time we came on the Tour de France, it would gone past his birthday. The speed is coming up now. Hellas is putting the pressure on, and uh, so Armstrong and Ulrich now have, have got rid of everybody else. And here, Leisaker, well, Sean, what a great shame it is that, uh, in some respects, he's riding hard to get a stage victory. On the other hand, the two main contenders for the crown in Paris are now about to bang each other's head together. Has he got any chance of staying away under that circumstance with those two down there? Well, I think he has... Uh he has a chance because he's still around the minute in minute and 15 seconds uh, uh, and uh, you know we see uh, uh, we see the telecom boys and uh, Rubella was setting quite a pace because you know uh, Kivalev and Serrano Moncotti uh, they were all dropping off the rear so the pace must have been quite hot and you know Leseki was still holding on to uh, just over the minute uh, so I uh, I think he could just about get there it depends on uh, here us now he's took up the pace and uh, depending on you know how long he set the pace for and if Armstrong attacks in you know in, in, in the next uh, in the next kilometre or uh, I think you know it, it could be dangerous for Leseki but otherwise I think he could make it to the finish well that's the input then from Sean Kelly we've got a massive list of the successes over the years and he was giving us the input of uh, his uh, knowledge of riding in uh, in Spain and how the Spanish react to it as well as ever uh, Sean a little bit modest about it, and I just flicked at the book here this isn't everything he's done but certainly won the Tour of the Basque Country the Tour of Catalonia at least twice uh, won the these are the Spanish based trains Simon Catalan as well we won't go into his massive uh, victories in the uh, single day uh, class where he was uh, so dominant in the years north of his fall jersey but he's so modest about his racing in Spain certainly he had a fair lot of success in there with those victories in those shorter races as well did as well ride in the uh, Tour of Spain I'm trying to find out here I think he actually got the points during the Tour of Spain didn't you Sean? Yes uh, I, uh, I won the points jersey I think on two occasions in the Tour of Spain uh, you know the Tour of Spain for me wasn't uh, uh, was an important event because of the Spanish sponsor Cas. It was uh, I remember the boss of the Cas saying, well for him uh, the, f the most important thing of the year was the Tour of Spain, and after that uh, the rest. And you know the classics was something that uh, he was never interested in because uh, what he said to me was Cas was a soft drinks for him. He said I cannot sell soft drinks in Belgium because the weather is too cold. <laughs> a gem from Sean Kelly to go with the one the other day when he said about Lance Armstrong was on another planet and we all know that uh, Mr Armstrong landed on the moon some time ago. Sean, thanks for that input, I'm sure. A lot of people have been watching our programme over the uh, last uh, few days, this being stage 14, and many of them only have a chance to watch our live programme over the weekend and this will be the uh, last one over the uh, weekends where we have the big man. So we come to the Saturday and Sunday, the Sunday next week will be the run into Paris and that triumph and to race around the centre of Paris and up and down the Champs Elysees. Uh, we'll still be on air live every afternoon, uh, except tomorrow, which is rest day. British Eurosport and International Eurosport bringing you this race. More hours of coverage than we've ever had before. And it seems to me we're watching a classic race here, uh, which is uh, might be going towards Armstrong uh, to get his hat to give victory. But uh, I remember many years ago, when I first started working for Eurosport, my producer said, no... Don't say who's going to win, David, because on that occasion it looked like Fignon was going to beat Le Mans in the times round of Paris. In fact, it was Le Mans that beat Fignon and got the Tour de France by eight seconds. It ain't over yet. Two kilometres only to go. They say they're going up here in front of his crowd. We've not really seen from the helicopter how... Uh, 
this trap, these last two Ks go up and up and up. It's a, an ascent which is almost unbelievable. And there are two Ks to go. We're going to show you a profile on the screen, but it cannot in any way give you the flavour of these last two kilometres as he winds his way up towards the top of this great ski resort. This is where we run in here, just showing you the zigzag bit, uh, not exactly showing the steepness of it, but you see those uh, uh, hairpin bends, they are very steep as well, and then it flattens out a little bit, then it goes steep again, and those last, uh, even the last 100 metres, as uh, they come round here, that's about uh, 150, and then that's about 100 metres to go, and then straight up, where a massive crowd here, it's not only in the gantries here, and on either side too, but up on the mountainside, round about us, this great ski resort here, can the people up there on the top, so looking down, it's it's a magnificent grandstand, and you're seeing bits of it uh, from time to time here on your screen. The place then with the, uh, the ski resort being in the winter, full of people go whizzing down the mountain on their skis. This man now trying to get some extra strength in his legs as he gets towards the top of this um, uh, race here. And what a day it will be if he gets the victory here. And what, I think too, Sean, a way in which it is uh, repaying Jean-Marie Leblanc for putting in this team as a wildcard selection. Yes, well, again, they have proved their point. Uh, as we said, the other teams, the French teams, were selected. But, you know, what, uh, what a ride by Lesecki and, uh, you know, on his home ground as such with so many supporters. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an unbelievable ride and a fabulous ride. And, you know, he's definitely going to get the finish now because Belly's at 40 seconds and Armstrong, at, Armstrong Ulrich and Harris at 113. So I think, you know, he should, uh, he should have no problem making the finish. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they definitely deserve this because, they, you know, they've tried very hard, uh, the Escatel team. Uh, we've seen them on, uh, in the Alps and also in the Pyrenees. They've they really went out and, uh, in the breaks and uh, really went worked hard. And uh, I think they merit our stage win in this tour. And Armstrong accelerating here and hanging on to his wheels. Ulrich, who doesn't seem to have anything left in his tank to come past Armstrong, so it could be virtually even Stevens at the top here, as it has been uh, when they came into the race today. But uh, Armstrong has been dealing the death blow with his victories up on the Alpes and his victory uh, the other day in the uh, in the time trial, his victory too uh, yesterday when he really started to, to hammer people out of the of his wheel. Well, they say there you can see the zigzag up in front of you. It doesn't really give you the complete feeling of the steepness of the climbs. Uh, this man, Lysaka, then, riding for, he comes from a place called Gernika, G-E-R-N-I-C-K. And look at that in front of you now. You're getting a bit of the flavour, but you can't, unfortunately, at your home, in the pub, wherever you're watching this, sense the atmosphere as the Basques are going to celebrate what's looked, we hope, with one coming to go, a victory for this professional, 32 years of age, he turned pro in 1994. He'd been riding with the USKD team all his career. Didn't have a victory until 1999, when he had two victories. The Tapa Alto de Abantos in the Tour of Spain, and also a victory in the Salita a Tixicalo. I can only say that the best I can do, because printed in Basque language, it's TX. IT, XA, RRO, the Basques have their own language and I don't know what it is celebrating in uh, Basque language but as Ulrich and... Ulrich goes in the attack, Harris was, yes. setting, Harris was setting the pace and uh, you know, Ulrich has went in the attack now but uh, Armstrong is, you know, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's taking it easier today and I don't, think, uh, I don't think he's too concerned about the stage certainly and I, uh, you know, uh, with the Basque right up front I think he, he, you know, he's, uh, he's not too worried and he doesn't seem to be want to attack uh, Ulrich at all but Harris, what a, uh, what a comeback because you know, the beginning of the tour he had a big problem with the tendonitis in his knee he crashed in the team time trial and a lot of people were talking that he'd never uh, he'd never finish this tour and in the, the in the abs he would never get through but he's he's definitely come around and he's proved a lot of people wrong and it's Harris that won the Tour of Spain last year when the rider out in front uh, it's uh, 1 minute 12 uh, is the gap back to these two Laysega got the stage victory into the Tapa Akalis last year the stage into Akalis which was that horrific climb uh, when they almost fell off their bikes with their front wheels up in the air so Roberto Laysega got that stage victory into Akalis which is one 
the worst and hardest climbs in cycle racing. So he's had three victories to his credit. Two victories in 99, of which one was in the uh, Tour of Spain. One victory last year over that uh, Carlos climb, which is really the hardest climb that any of us have seen in cycle racing. And now he's going to get this one up here to Luxardi Den on his orange bike, in his orange jersey, in front of the uh, Basque flags that are flying. And there you can see a Colombian flag also in the background. Many of the Colombians that extract back to uh, uh, their previously home country of Spain out here too. The Venezuelan too rides for his team Echeverria. Again, that's off a Spanish extract. But here, from the north of Spain, from the Basque country, right up alongside the border, it's going to be a phenomenal roar when he comes through here to get the victory. And Dardale, this is a great one for Leiseka, scoring on his fourth victory in his career. Sean, any victory is a good victory, but... Uh, yes, well, he's, 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 he's certainly worked hard for this one. Uh, you know, he went... Uh, they've been out there a number of days, but today, again, like he worked, like I said, he's worked very hard, and, uh, you know, he's a, a great win and a, a, a merited win, but, you know, he's a, he's, he's a class rider. He's won two stages in the Tour of Spain. He won a stage last year and the previous year, so, you know, he doesn't really, he isn't that he hasn't any performed at the top level, uh, but, he, you know, certainly in Spain, he has some very, very good results. And we see uh, Belly coming in now. He's going to finish second. And, you know, what a brave ride by him as well. He's been out there for a long time today. And, uh, you know, he's, he's dug in there and head on for, uh, to, to finish second at the stage. Well, he was there hoping to do well in the Tour of Italy until he got thrown off following that confrontation with the spectator. He's got better every day of the race, by the way. He looked a bit rough early on in the race, but Belly now uh, coming up here. He started 24th spot this morning, and now here come the two riders who have been giving us great entertainment ever since they hit the bottom of the Alpe d'Huez. And look at that. What a great sign. Little touch of hands there. That is true sportsmanship by Armstrong and Ulrich. I think they settle their differences now. I'm not saying it's over yet into Paris, but that was a wonderful gesture. What do you think, Sean? Yes, well, you know, he... I suppose he said, well, you know, well done. Uh, there was nothing I can do to, uh, uh, you know, to shake my wheel. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, that's the way it's done, really. You know, you, you go out there on your bike and you race very, very hard. You give each other a really hard time, but after the event, like, you shake hands and you're, you're the best of friends and you talk with each other following morning in the start. So then, they say up on the stage, Armstrong is still in yellow. Diderus, the French champion, coming up here too. You can see on the screen, 32, nearly 33 kilometers per hour. And that uh, is about, what, uh, 4, 8 to 30, about 20 miles an hour. And when you take into account that they've been over two oak category climbs in the last uh, 40 kilometers, they started out with an undulating course with uh, two-fourths and one-third category climb. Then they went up the first category, the Col d'Aspen. Then the famous Col de Tourmalet. And then to finish up the top of Luz Ardizen. But what a great, well-timed victory it was for Lysaker of the Escadel Oscar team. But uh, Armstrong still in yellow at the end of this stage 14. You can see down there the club 243, 244. Uh, the some riders are going to come in, I should think, probably, Sean, up to half an hour down. Is it sort of course today when they're going to be fighting the, to stay inside the time limit now after Lysake has won the stage and Ulrich can, uh, uh, has finished with uh, Armstrong almost hand in hand? Yes, well, it's a, it's a stage that you know, a lot of the guys will fight uh, very hard to stay inside the time limit because uh, they raced very, very hard, hard in the beginning and uh, a lot of riders were on the first climb. Uh, the, uh, the Ashpan, they were blown out and it's a long way to finish from there. Uh, so it will be a difficult one for them to get inside the time limit here and lose that to the end. It will be, uh, it will be a fight all the way for those guys, although uh, you know, they're finishing 20, 25 minutes plus down on, uh, on Liseke. They will still have to fight very hard to stay inside the time limit uh, to stay in the race. And especially the last real day of the mountains uh, you know it's uh, it's a day you don't want to be eliminated you never want to be eliminated in the tour but certainly not on the last day of the mountains you know the guys will really fight uh, will fight at 100% just to stay in the race well fighting amongst those 
their riders further down the slope is uh, uh, Stuart O'Grady, start this morning in the Green Points jersey, uh, and also Eric Zabel, who's batting it out for that Green Points competition. They want to stay in the race to get to, to the finishing straight in the uh, Champs Elysees. But what does the finish it'll be, by the way, Sean, if these two keep chipping away at each other, Zabel and O'Grady, because they're coming onto the more undulating or even flat courses from now on in, and uh, what if it's all down to the sprint on the Champs Elysees in, in one week's time for the Green Jersey? Well, it, it, it would not be the first time, Davis. I remember one of the years uh, uh, I was uh, with the um, with the green jersey. I going for the green jersey, and Frank Host was very close to me, and it was down to the Champs Elysees sprint. And Host actually uh, beat me the sprint in the Champs Elysees and, and won the green jersey that year. But I think we will see a very interesting uh, uh, battle for the green jersey because we see today already in the first hot spot sprint, we see the tele telecom riders were trying to set it up for Zab and, and uh, the, the credit out of cold guys are break. They were you know attacking, trying to take the points from him so I think over the next couple of days we will see uh, quite a battle between those two for the green jersey and they'll be battling over more uh, more, that's like more more human territory more humane territory uh, from now on in as they, the sprinters uh, will be looking forward to the next few days those will survive we lost one of our sprinters but early on uh, well, yesterday it's unfortunate that uh, Hunter Robert Hunter who was uh, riding very well at the start of this uh, race he's from South Africa and Robert I don't know if you're listening to our program now but we look forward to coming back into the Tour de France and also the big races in the future Robert dropped out yesterday. Uh, one of the sprinters still hanging on in there, uh, Jimmy Casper uh, came in 41 minutes down yesterday. He was 153rd and we have 152 rows left in this race from the 189 that uh, started the race way back uh, exactly two weeks ago. So we've gone right the way down to the south of France on the course, which is quite a fascinating uh, run down. In fact, 190 rows, just got my sums uh, re-corrected here. 21 nations, 21 teams, who would expect, in fact, the Basque nation isn't listed on our nation's hits. They're down as from Spain, but I suppose we had actually 22 nations, because the Basques look upon themselves as a separate nation in their I won't get into the politics of it all, but they speak a very different language. And if you ever go to northern Spain, all you see are lots of X's and Z's and T's and R's and what have you. But here, uh, the man taking the stage today, adding to the two big tour victory he got in the Tour of Spain the year before and last year, now this one in the Tour de France. See him there on his jersey, Pay Basque. Well, we cover the tour of the Basque Country, we cover the tour of Catalonia, which again is a, a nation which says it's almost separate. And there we can see that the, down they say Spanish against him, but uh, not be disrespectful to Spain, but uh, they will also uh, be cheering him in as victor today. But they say that the Basque rider get the victory had uh, Belly in second spot, Ulrich third, Armstrong fourth, Harris fifth, Bilocchi sixth, uh, Sevilla seventh. And that's a good ride by, uh, by Sevilla, by the way, Sean. He's, he's the rider who's in the uh, uh, young riders competition, the white jersey, just behind Bilocchi, who finished third last year, and Harris who won the uh, Tour of Spain. That uh, Sevilla is certainly showing good form, eh? Yes, he is. He's been consistent uh, over the mountain stages, and uh, you know he's hanging in there. And I think he's uh, he's actually probably gets, uh, he's improving as we go on because he seems to be moving up in the classement of the stages. Uh, so he's you know one of the elevations of the one of the new guys of the tour. What is this sort of as now? Who's that lovely shot of those two saying, "Well, that's it. Well done." Uh, what is the I say quantum leap, but we've often seen with the riders coming through, uh, like Patero getting with the, the young riders, also getting the King of Man's competition, then Montero getting the young riders' competition, and then uh, Severe looking nice to get the young riders. What is it like when you uh, have one victory already and you've got to go on a bit further like you're suddenly fighting like my chambers have to uh, with the older boys Sevilla is now getting it but Sevilla seems to have been uh, coping with this in the overall competition quite well I think he had a couple of bad days early on but uh, uh, he's come back very well and what, what was his future like then compared with Manchester or do you have a, a season after you've been a young rider when it takes a bit of time to settle down well, yes, uh, sometimes we see a young rider coming on and, uh, you know, we see Manchebo last year, he was, uh, you know, very, very consistent and uh, this year, you know, he's not uh, not as consistent and certainly we haven't seen him as, as much as last year, but that's the way it goes, uh, you know, the years uh, uh, the years go by, but, you know, if you look at Manchebo, he probably hasn't lost a lot of time, uh, just that he had a white jersey yesterday, you probably, uh, uh, you know, you, or last year, sorry, you, you, you know, you pick him out more and this year he's probably, you know, down in 10 or 11 to 12 places, you know, probably 15 to 20, 20 minutes down, so it's, he's probably, you know, not writing, uh, not writing any much, uh, any worse than he would. 
not any worse than last year or he's riding as good as last year let's call it uh, but Sevilla like he's a new guy and we seem to know some more when they have the, when they have the young jersey and you kind of look at him well he said yourself he's a guy for the next couple of years and I suppose we expect a bit too much of him you know the following year after being the young rider uh, winning the young rider jersey that uh, we expect maybe to be up there with the big guys but probably a bit too early yet well now we're seeing a 32 year old up there taking the stage victory this stage 14 from Taub to Lutz Ardiden 144 kilometres uh, the final day in the Pyrenees and certainly a, a great contrast from the young rider we just been talking about Severe to this very experienced rider here too as well uh, Sean what is it about the Tour de France when so many older riders uh, can, can perform well as their careers go on I mean, like Fulador was, uh, was second but he was still going until he was nearly 40 I think Duke Sotobuk was about 39 when he won the Tour de France 38, 39 what keeps these older riders going? Well, I think, you know, in the Tour, uh, the older riders, first of all, the experience they've got, but also the Tour is, you know, it's uh, it's it's a long, hard event over three weeks, and, you know, when you get the experience, uh, and, you know, up to up to 35, I think you can perform at top level, and it depends on what way uh, uh, mentally you are. I think physically you can do it, but mentally is a problem, and, uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you right mentally, you can uh, you can prepare for your Tour right, and, you're, you know, you're... you're you're ready for the tour. Uh, well, then I think you can you can perform at quite a good level at at, at, at a top level, and you know you can you can be there with, as one of the favourites for the tour. Well, the tour's come into the Pyrenees. We're going down into the Flatterlands to rest overnight and tomorrow. And the man there in the yellow jersey, who really well, we talked about him being a poker player. He kept his cards to his chest, I don't like cliches, but that's exactly what he did until we went on the stage at Finte Alpes He then showed his true metal, he rumped away, and he's been up there in the time trial that afterwards, he's been dominating now in the charity of the specialist club. He went into the race this morning with a lead over Jan Ulrich of 5 minutes and 13 seconds. They came across the line together on this stage here. The question is, will they go across the line together? at the end of the stage into Paris. They certainly won't cross the line together because the sprinter will be in there going full bore uh, for, no doubt still, that green coach jersey which has been fought out between uh, Ulrich's teammate, Sabel, and the battling Aussie, Stuart O'Grady. So there's the German rider alongside the American. How things have changed over the earth. There's so many nations now taking part in the Tour de France, all of them wanting to do something in this uh, big tour. Let's not forget that coming up later on, if we have time on our live coverage, here we'll have the King of the Mountains jersey, uh, Lolot Jalabert. We may have the white jersey of Oscar Seville, uh, but uh, I think somehow we might go before uh, we get to those presentation photos. But we do have highlights programs tonight when we have not only the uh, pictures of the presentation of photos, but also looking back at some of the things that happened during the day. Uh, Mike Smith, have you got your recap and looking on to the programme after this? Indeed we have, uh, so don't go away folks, we'll go through it one more time for you to see whether Lysaka really did win the stage, of course he did, and then of course we've got our highlights programme later tonight, much later tonight by the way, David, it's not on until 11.15 but it's a double one, we've got a couple of hours of it, so plenty of time for you to watch the Tour de France again here on Eurosports. So those of you watching our live coverage then, uh, uh, Sean Kelly, myself, David Duffield, will be uh, going down into the valleys and on to a day off as well. Back in uh, Britain, Mark Bronson and uh, the British Eurosport presenters over there will also be taking a bit of a breather. We'll be coming into our coverage here and I think we're going back to Paris after this, so it's time for us to say bye-bye for a very hot and happy 